Oh, anyway, welcome this morning um, to uh, Hosanna Fellowship, where we're going to be looking at the topic of I'm alone and being alone. Um, now, we don't want you to feel lonely, so what we'd really love for you to do right now is to all stand and to join with us, because see, when you join in with people, you're not alone. We'd love you to put your hands together, join in with us with the music team.
more reflective song here, it's my time. Reflecting on how awesome God is. Amen. Across the room and down the aisles, and 
And uh, this is what we as a Zana Fellowship do as part of our worship to God. We give back to God from all the riches that He's given us. So while that's happening, I'm just going to um, pray for the giving. Lord, I just want to thank you today that you give us this opportunity to worship you in this way. By giving back to you by all the wonderful riches that you give us, Lord. We just want to thank you for that opportunity, Lord. And we just ask that you bless what's been given today. And all the people said? Amen. Right. Hands up all those who used to be children. Come on, there really shouldn't be anybody with their hands up. Come on, hands up anybody who used to be a, a, a child. Okay, hands up if you're still a child. Yeah, I noticed a lot of adults heads stayed up. Okay, then in two weeks' time, guess what is happening? We have the Children's Church production here at Hosanna Fellowship on the 18th of October, 10 o'clock in the morning. So what's the date? What time? That's 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay, if you come at 10 past 10, you're going to get seats way over there. Okay, so come early, get a good seat, because there is going to be a lot of people here. Now, that's actually where the children are now. They're out there practicing for this production. It is going to be fantastic. They're going to be singing, dancing, playing instruments, acting, probably doing this part as well, I hope. So, that is two weeks' time here at Zana Fellowship. Now, I'm going to ask you to join in with me again for something else that um, we're doing. So, please, I'm going to ask everyone to just, on their feet, please, and we have the house lights up. Just ask everyone to rise their feet. This is October, and for October, our church is doing Pastor Appreciation Month. So I want you to put your hands together for Gary Colby. several occasions, I really do appreciate you, Gary. I appreciate what you do for me, what you do for this church, and what you do for Porter Road. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Please be seated. Now, chance for you guys to just sit back, relax, and see what the team has to do. Send a message 
Send a message in the bottle. Message in the bottle. Send a message in the bottle. Saturday, eh? Yeah, it was. It was a good party, yeah. Lots of people. Yeah. It, sorry, you say it's an awesome party, but it just seems strange because you didn't look like you were having a good time. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, you and George look like you two are getting pretty heated. <laughs> oh, bro, that. Don't worry about that, man. There's nothing to it. You know he was only kidding, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, don't worry about it. Nothing to it. There's nothing to it. Why'd you leave? You just sort of stormed out of there. You know, when you left, it kind of imploded. The whole place went real quiet. What are you, some kind of shrink? It was a good party. Let's leave it at that, man. <laughs> yeah, it was a good party. But you don't just walk out because someone sends a bad joke. Be something else. All right. Do you ever get the feeling that even when you're with all the guys, that nobody actually knows who you are? And then, in fact, they don't care so long as you're putting up the front. You know, I've, I just don't think, you know, of all the guys, you know, there's no one there that, that I think really knows me and that I really know in turn. You know, and I know George is only kidding, but it's true. You know? I mean, my dad did walk out on me. And... He's not the only one. I mean, it's, it seems that every time, you know, you need someone. And if you reach out to them, 
they always just walk away from you. I just feel like that really I've got no one. And the worst thing is, after Saturday, everyone knows it. you off, but um, look, um, Jean is waiting across town. Um, uh, I said I'd catch up with him, but hey, look, we'll, we'll text me, text me, we'll, we'll catch up, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Cool. But this is a subject, I think, that really touches the heart of every one of us to some degree or another. Whether it's because of who we are or what's happened to us in our own lives, whatever it is, one could really say, in some senses, at some time in our lives, maybe even now, that whole cry, I'm all alone. I'm alone. I want to ask you questions that occurred perhaps a little earlier. Have you ever been to a party or a gathering where everybody's hanging out together and people keep saying, good party, hey, good party. You know one of the interesting things that I sort of think about was years ago I used to go to parties and used to do things and everybody would be saying good party, but I really think that most of us are saying it because we wanted to feel that we were part of what was meant to be happening and really wasn't. Most parties are not that good, if we're really honest. A lot of, a lot of them are just pointless exercises of a lack of human relationships. And then I want to ask you, have you ever gone to an out-of-town restaurant you're seated all alone at the table and you're watching around and you see people all around the room who are there with somebody or maybe a group of them. And they seem to be having a reasonably good time and you're sitting alone. I know one, on one of my trips overseas, while a guy <coughs> was on my way home and one of the worst experiences I've had traveling happened to me. I was sitting in the airport lounge Wanting to get home, I'd been away too long already as far as I was concerned. And then this announcement came across the PA system saying that the plane had accidentally, ha ha ha, been double booked. And so there was a whole heap of us in the airport. Those of us who had managed to get there early had gotten seats, and those who hadn't gotten there early enough had no seats. And all over the room, all over the place, there were people who, who were in distress. Families who knew they weren't going to be able to make connecting flights, so all sorts of messy things happening. I heard one family sitting, talking next to me, and saying, this has ruined our whole holiday. But I had a ticket to get home. And I sat and I watched people and I was desperate to get home. I was on my own and I was alone. I just wanted to be back here with my wife and with you lovely people who embarrassed me totally this morning. And uh, <clears throat> I just saw people who were desperate and in the end I gave up my ticket. And it was a strange thing happened. There was a group of us who gave up our tickets. And they offered to put us on a, on a different airline, on a Qantas airline, and we had to fly via Australia to get home, which was a lot longer trip and more delays. But suddenly, there was a group of us who never knew each other in the slightest. And we had one purpose and one cause, and we traveled together 
and almost didn't get on the next plane. Because in front of us, after we'd traveled right across LA airport to where Qantas was, which was a long way away from where the other airline was, a bus trip away, there was this Mexicana flight going through customs ahead of us, and almost every one of them had contraband, either under those big high hats they wear or in their bags. I couldn't believe that people would even try to the extent that these guys were trying, and they were being stopped, and we almost missed our plane. But we were together somehow. A group of strangers were together, and suddenly you're not alone. Suddenly there were things we found common to talk about. But one of the things I think often happens is when we end up getting moved to strange places we, we've never been before. When I was a child in a two-year period, I ended up in five schools. And one of the most devastating things in my childhood was the fact I would always arrive not at the beginning of the year, except for the last school. And I, partway through the year, and the children had already formed all their friendships and cliques and groups, and, and I was very, very alone. It devastated me personally. It made a huge impact on my education. And I went through some real trauma. And there was a real loneliness that happened in that period of my life. It can happen to anybody. There's a story in the scripture, in the second book of Kings, about a, a woman in a little village called Shunem. She's just called the Shunemite woman. And she was in the middle of this little town in southwest of the Sea of Galilee, about 2,700 years ago. And uh, at that time, the Israelite community had turned away from God, and as a consequence, there were all sorts of social problems happening. As a consequence, the community was facing devastation. They were alone, without God, and on their own. And repeatedly what happened, God sent his prophets into the land to try and warn the people about what they would be facing. And they, they didn't understand this yearning in their hearts, this loneliness that they felt. Well, one day this guy who was a prophet now, prophets are pretty powerful people. This guy called Elisha turned up in this town. And this woman persuaded him to take some food. And so it was often that he would pass by in that town and she would offer him food. And she was feeling extremely lonely because she was a woman who wanted to be connected to God, but the rest of the community weren't. It was an awful situation for her to face. And she was a wealthy woman. And then along comes this man of God. And she got to know him personally as a friend and persuaded her husband to make a spare room on the house. He built one on the house so that Elisha, who had been a, in a lonely, lonely task on his own, carrying God's message that wasn't popular with the people. And the Shunammite woman and her husband made friends with Elisha. And as a consequence, the story eventuated that God used that Shunammite woman and God used Elisha. And there was this kind of friendship that grew so powerfully that it changed her life and it changed Elisha's, Elisha's life. Just a, a woman in a town somewhere. Just like you're a man or a woman in this town. In the scripture we find all sorts of people who went through this loneliness journey. One of the uh, psalmists who wrote the song, a psalm's a song, 
wrote the song. He, he wrote it and he talked about it in the song. And he, he said, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied me. Free, free, free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. My integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. You hear the cry of this guy who says openly, I feel lonely. And God, in some way, I want to connect with you. Well, I think a lot of us are like that at times. We'd love to make connection with somebody. But we need to understand what this loneliness thing is because I think for some of us, we get trapped by it. See, the difference between aloneness and loneliness is quite distinct. There are some people who are alone, but they're not lonely. Some ascetics love to be alone and they don't feel lonely at all. They don't want to be around people at all. So they go off and they live in the wild, they live in the bush, whatever. To be alone is to be by oneself. That can be okay. I actually love that sometimes. I just love to go in my workshop and I love just to, to be alone. Bashing bits of metal instead of bashing people. I'd like to bash sometimes. You know? That's alone, being alone. Having aloneness, good time out sometimes. But to be lonely is to suffer the feelings of loneliness, to want people and social contact and yet to be, uh, yet be unable to get it. That's loneliness. That's what it really is. And given this fact, it is quite possible to feel lonely when you are alone. But it is also possible to feel lonely when you're in a crowd or not alone. You can be in a huge crowd, like I mentioned earlier, in a party, and feel so, so alone. And you might even be sitting here and feeling that aloneness in that way, that loneliness in that way. So what is loneliness? What really is loneliness? Well, it is, a, is it a feeling or a condition? Is it something, is it a sickness? I want to tell you now, it's not. It's, it's much more than that. For different people, it actually means very different things. For different people, it's caused by different things. We'll look at that. It is hard to describe exactly what it is, in fact, or how, we, uh, come, uh, how come we feel this way. Perhaps a better question is, what is loneliness for you as a person? I read uh, extensively in researching for this and was amazed to find that huge numbers of universities and other professionals have done research on the subject all around the world. In fact, more than any other subject I've researched. I was quite amazed. And some of the study, they even have, have studied animals to see how animals and primates and others have been affected by this. But the reality is that this is a huge issue that we do face in society. So perhaps a, a better way to, in, in terms of asking this question and, and, and addressing what is loneliness for you, it might be best to describe some aspects of it. And it, Some aspects might affect you totally, and there might be uh, a lot of things included in this list. There might be only one or two things, but it might define loneliness. And we, we, we're coming to a place this morning where I hope we're able to alleviate any loneliness. Or if you know somebody who's suffering loneliness, that you might be able to help them on the journey. So what does loneliness feel like? Well, first of all, people who have written about it lots use the term painful very often. In fact, it's the most commonly used term about loneliness. The most frequently mentioned experience of loneliness Words used to describe it like they feel hurt, sorrow, they have ache, sadness, depression, torn up, bleeding and broken are the terms that people write about in their poetry and in their thoughts about their loneliness. Going back centuries, the same picture is painted over and over and over again. Talk, they talk about feeling lost, having no sense of clear direction. And they talk about it being a persistent feeling 
a really persistent feeling. In fact, for some of us, we don't even realize how powerful this loneliness can get. You see, some people are better at alleviating the loneliness, loneliness than others, but the persistence doesn't go away. It can be fleeting, but it keeps coming back. Or it, or it can be there all the time. And for every person, it's different. It particularly happens when we lose loved ones, parents, maybe a husband or wife or, or children, or we lose close friends, whatever it is. That, that can be a trigger point for real, deep, powerful loneliness that causes us pain. So that's the experience of a lot of people. The second one is a feeling of nothingness. The description that people have given it. It's been described as a void, a black hole, an abyss, hollow, a dark night of the soul, like Luther, who was a famous reformer of about 400 years ago. And empty space, a feeling that something is missing for many people who are suffering loneliness. So it's a feeling of nothingness, a feeling of, of desperation at points. And loneliness can also be described as overwhelming. There's a feeling of despair, not knowing how much more of this painful loneliness one can take. Sometimes feeling as if you are going to break apart at any minute. And I've counseled people over the years who have said this. They feel like they're on the edge of an abyss. Feel like they're about to fall or they're already falling. And they feel desperate at times. And then there's the, the, the other area in this one. There's this whole sense of feeling no emotions, feeling numb. In actual fact, what's actually happened here, at some point in time, we may decide not to feel anymore. It may not be a totally conscious decision. We just shut down. That's what happens to some people. We become cold-hearted. and We can still function in life for many people who suffer this. And most people wouldn't even detect it. But we may become so overburdened with pain, the hurt, the sorrow, the loss of control, uh, that we shut our emotional center right down. We don't want to feel anymore. And then they say that uh, loneliness is um, compounded problems that's here because one of the things that happens when we start suffering this loneliness, it gets worse in a sense. It's self-perpetuating. It sort of happens in a destructive way. Because what actually research that's been conducted has shown that people generally tend to reject lonely people. So if you're lonely, then you get rejected even more, so it makes it worse. And people have seen that, and some of you will have experienced this. And it's simply, the researchers have said when they did the research, they discovered that it's because they act lonely. So if you act lonely, then you're going to be lonely. But how do you fix it if you're feeling lonely? It's, it's a problem. Who likes a person that is always stuck in the corner and doesn't like to talk to anybody? Nobody's going to be friendly. It's very difficult to hold a conversation with somebody who's sitting and going, hmm, hmm. They don't know quite what to say or how to say it. And the question has to arise, can anyone ever truly understand what it is to be you, to experience all the things you have experienced, to understand your joys, your happiness, your pains, and your sorrows? Can anybody understand that? I don't think anybody can truly. I hate it when empathetic people get there and say, oh, I know how you feel. Piffle waffle. Rubbish. You might have some ideas as to how I might feel, but you don't really know. In fact, you know, there's an interesting thing in the Scripture that says, only God knows our inner being. The mistakes people have made when there's been loneliness sitting. Most of you have probably heard about Job. You may not have read his story, but Job had an extremely lonely experience. Well, even his best friends decided to help him because they knew what his problem was. At the end of the day, they got it all wrong. They got it totally wrong. 
wrong. He lost his family. He lost his home. He lost his wealth. He lost everything. The only person that was there was his wife, and she was a problem because she turned around to him and says, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> Great support she was. But that's the way that loneliness functions. and often engenders those kinds of responses from other people. What is loneliness really then? Well, I, I sort of did some real pondering on this, and I think it can be defined in this sort of way. You know, you see this hand of the person in the bus, and, um, and it's, there's a lovely photo of that. It's not showing up as well on this, but it's loneliness in the crowd, the bus ride, the train ride, whatever it is. And loneliness is a longing for something more. If you get it down to the tightest thing. You see, some people hey, I don't need much company with other people to feel satisfied in their relationships, and they don't feel lonely. Whereas other people, they need abundantly more contact with other humans, abundantly more involvement, abundantly more participation. Loneliness is longing for something more. That's really what it's about. So for every person, it's going to be different. We sometimes call this longing for something more by the term loneliness because that is the situation or the symptom by which such feelings are either triggered or identified. So for every one of us, it's different. But actually, let's have a look at some causes because we really have looked at uh, the consequences rather than the causes up to this point. I'd like to pick up on the causes of loneliness because what actually happens in loneliness, we have these changes, these mood changes, these, these, uh, these different moments in our life where we feel very differently. And sometimes the loneliness can be really red. Sometimes it can be uh, a deep, a deep uh, sense of sadness. It can be expressed in all sorts of different colors. One of the uh, most profound things that I've ever experienced is when in my childhood in terms of the loneliness thing is to be moving, as I said, from school to school, from location to location. And trying to understand why these things happen, you, you, you don't figure it out easily. The first thing that's been suggested by the researchers is that being abused and rejected by others is a key one. You know, often they say that People who have been adopted as children suffer incredible measures of loneliness that affects their whole lives. And they actually really don't know quite what to do to respond to it. And so often they will do things that actually are not very helpful to them in the long term. Because when you've been adopted, often it's because you've been rejected by the parents for some reason or other. In actual fact, it may not be an overt rejection. Sometimes parents have give, uh, of a child have given up the child because they felt that was going to be the healthiest thing for that child. But that doesn't change the feelings of the person inside. A lot of people go through experience of loneliness, and one of the things that happens when they go through this experience uh, when they're children, they'll often say to their parents um, that they think that they're being adopted. They think that they don't belong to the family somehow. But being abused and rejected by others can happen in all sorts of ways. And you can imagine all the different scenarios, and they can be so real and so powerful and so destructive. But being abused and rejected by others is one of the big keys. Being unable to fit in. I had a very, very dear friend who's since died. His mother, unfortunately, and when I met this man, he was 60-odd years old. His mother, unfortunately, from the time he was a little boy, had always put him in shoes and trousers and shirts that were old-fashioned. Way, way, way out of date. I'm talking way out of date. When I first met my friend Lloyd... Lloyd used to wear these shoes that looked like they were made in the 1920s. Now, I, yes, he was an older person, 
But most older guys by those days were not wearing those kinds of shoes. Not looking like that. Lloyd had constant conflict with other people. But he was such a generous man. And he lived through this dilemma. And it was only after I arrived in Kawarau that we built a friendship and a relationship that was very, very powerful. We used to kid each other a lot. We got along really well. You know, one of the most amazing things for me was when Lloyd told me the story, and I know he doesn't mind me telling the story. He's dead now in any case, but it's the Lord, and he's probably not thinking about those things. But Lloyd had a transformation happen for him. First of all, he connected with God, and secondly, he started connecting with other people in a way he'd never connected before, and God started using him. And he suddenly had a transformation happen. He suddenly had great relationships happening with a lot of people. And it was pretty sudden. Over a period of about three years. That, that sounds like a long time to some of you. But when you've lived as long as him, three years is nothing. Shyness. Now, some people will argue that shyness is caused by loneliness. But some people, actual loneliness comes about because of shyness. And shyness could have been caused by some of these other things, but not always. It's not always explainable in some contexts. Shyness and loneliness have a very strong relationship with each other, so the researchers say. One of the big obstacles is mental, that if you're a shy person, you believe that if you go and talk to people, they will reject you, because maybe in your family, communication skills were not the greatest thing, or whatever. Then the last one, broken heart or missing someone. If you've got a broken heart or you're missing someone, a broken heart because of a relationship, because of moving homes, because of all sorts of other things that actually happen. We need to be aware of the fact of what actually is happening inside us. So let's look at dealing to our loneliness. And I want to be fairly quick with this. The guys are going to come up shortly and They're going to sing a song for us. Remember, every person who has ever lived has been lonely. That's the truth. At some point in our lives, we've been lonely. Love wouldn't exist without loneliness to inspire it, however. I wanted a greater measure of love, and so one of the things that attracted me to my wife is I thought she would make a great person to share my life with. I wouldn't have to live alone anymore. And I was fortunate I found a good one. Because you don't always succeed in that story. And then every person has ever lived has been lonely. But if we're going to deal with that, we need to learn to to actually look at our loneliness with detachment. We, We can't afford to continue to allow our loneliness to control us totally. We need to be willing to step aside from what our loneliness has. You know, the reality is that we need to think about exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it. We need to think about uh, what are the things that are there that are getting in my way. What are the things that are controlling my life? The second one, realize that we all get lonely. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you at all. We're particularly prone to loneliness when we're making transitions, especially for the better. And I want to suggest to you that um, if you're changing or exploring your alternatives, it's going to be tough. You know, there are some people who, who suddenly connect with God But they lose a lot of their past friendships, and they they go through a little lonely patch connecting with God. In fact, that's not uncommon in the Scripture. When people are connecting with God, they're saying, God, it's only you. I'm all alone. But very soon, that changes. It takes time. Now, the reality is, for some of us, when we're exploring new journeys, it's going to change who we are. We need to separate loneliness and solitude, though, and I want to make this point right now because some people um, uh, enjoy solitude and they think, am I a lonely person? 
you know, no, you're not necessarily, only if it's impacting you negatively. Imagine this is the last day you'll ever be alone. What would you do? What would you do? Because if you, if you uh, are going to go and enjoy your last day and you have no problems with that and you don't need other people around or you can go and enjoy it and not be afraid, then perhaps solitude is what you face more than loneliness. Dealing to our loneliness. Make friends with yourself. This means you have to accept yourself just as you are and even begin to like yourself. In fact, do you know what? Jesus actually said there are two great things that you can do in life and the greatest things that you can do. And he called them commandments. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. The second is, is this, you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't learn to love yourself, you're not going to be able to love your neighbor. If you're not going to be able to love your neighbor, you're going to live a lonely life. That's the reality. That's a chain of events. That's the cause and consequences. Sometimes this means forgiving yourself and allowing God to forgive you. It's the reality of it. For the things you've done wrong in the past. You see, you've got to make friends with yourself. If you can't love yourself, then you're going to struggle with loneliness. And if you need help for that, maybe, maybe you need to think about getting help for it. Don't just go to somebody who's arbitrary and say, solve my loneliness. You need to make sure that you're getting good help. Don't go to people expecting they're going to change your loneliness by talking with them and saying, you know, I'm a really lonely person. I'd like to be spend lots of time with you. That's not going to fix it. Over the years, I've watched this happen so many times. People who are feeling lonely, they go to other people expecting that person to solve it, and all it does is compound their loneliness because the person can't cope with the overwhelming sense of the pressure that comes with that loneliness when people are desperate. So they back off, and it makes the loneliness even worse. You've got to make friends with yourself. And if you're going to do that, you've got to be able to go out and intentionally, it wasn't meant to come up in one shot, but never mind, Intentionally go out to connect. Listen more than talk. One of the biggest things about lonely people is that they talk lots. And nobody wants to listen. Really honestly, they don't. They want to interact. They don't want to be a listening board. Humans, to have no loneliness, are going to have healthy interactions. Listening and drawing people out will deepen your context more than just talking endlessly about yourself. Be careful not to be all about yourself. I don't know whether you've ever been in a situation. I certainly, in my own faulty life at points, have been in a situation and uh, I've talked too much and then realized what I've done. If you do that, you're going to isolate yourself and you have to be careful that you don't do it. And then the last one. Oops, sorry. Take the initiative in social relationships. We need to be people who really are going to take the initiative in social relationships. One of the things that sits there in front of our faces is that we, we, we sometimes don't take that initiative. We think that the other person should do something for us. That'll take away our loneliness. But how about you say to somebody, how about we go out for a coffee and you just sit there and enjoy listening to them. If they want you to talk, then it'll be healthier. How about you intentionally connect and some of you here are, are, are connected and some of you are not connected. As a pastor of this church, seeing as you're doing a pastor appreciation month, one of the greatest things I think you could do that would really uh, make me feel appreciated. I think it's okay to feel appreciated. I get embarrassed, but never mind. But one of the greatest things you could do is become a really active part of God's community. That doesn't mean just turning up on Sunday. That's a little bit of action. But to be committed to one another in small groups, 
You know one of the interesting things about Jesus in his life? He chose 12 people to travel around with and build healthy relationships with. One of the interesting things that's said about Jesus, he often went alone on his own to pray. One of the, often, the, the interesting sides to that story is that they knew what he prayed, so he wasn't that alone. There must have been somebody hanging around listening to him. You see, the relationships are really important that we end up building. So take the initiative in social relations. You might need, need to say to somebody, hey, hey, <coughs> would you like to hang out, go tend and bowling, do something? Whatever it is. But for goodness sake, don't push. Because if you do, you'll be lonely again. That's what happens. You need to stay relaxed. See, if you're the kind of person that experiences loneliness most of the time, then the, the loneliness you're experiencing is called trait loneliness. It's a descriptive term that's used to, 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 to describe the fact that it's something that's continuous. This type of loneliness that follows you everywhere. The loneliness is generated from the person, although particular circumstances may aggravate your loneliness. So, regardless of situation or circumstances, when you think about it, you are still lonely. You want to break that stuff. You want to get free from that stuff. Nobody deserves to be lonely. God never intended any of us to be lonely. And just like with Elisha and the Shunammite woman I told you the story about earlier, God designed us for community, to care for each other, to support each other, to love each other. And that's what his community is all about. So we really do need to connect to his community in a real powerful way and connect to him. No. Somehow or other I lost the sheep in this thing. But we need to learn to talk to God. We need to learn to talk to him really clearly and powerfully. I, one of the things that I've found in my own journey is that in talking to God, He really does change things for me. In talking to God, sometimes there's moments when I do feel a bit alone, and leaders in particular are conscious of loneliness more than a lot of people, apparently. And I just sit down and have a good chat with God, and sometimes I put on a song I can worship God with, and suddenly... There's something that transforms everything I'm facing. The kind of thing that happens for me because I'm a leader is <clears throat> when I have to deal with some kind of trauma, I can't involve a whole lot of people. I may be even on my own in it. And that can make you feel a bit lonely sometimes. But immediately, one of the, the great advantages of connecting with God is that I'm no longer alone. In fact, you know one of the interesting stories about the, that starts in Scripture? is that God was there, and he felt he wanted more company. If you put it in the description, this kind of somebody that he could talk with and have as a friend. Then he made man. It says this in Genesis so clearly. And then he said this, it's not good for man to be alone. So he made woman. And the man, Adam, was no longer alone. But there's all sorts of ways of sealing that deal. And I, I really want us to listen to this song that the guys have got here now. I want us to really connect and think about what's being said, and afterwards I'm going to just come up and speak a little briefly at the end. Let's give them a big welcome as they come out.
so hard to believe it if we never heard it. The voice of a father said her name. You're not alone. You're not alone. I never leave you. I never leave you. You're not alone. You're not alone. I never leave you. I never leave you alone. I just had a strange experience happen to me as I was sitting here. I said before I wasn't going to make another invitation. But I have a word from God, I believe, that says to me really clearly that somebody sat here and said, I'm not going forward unless you get Gary to come back up there and tell me to come down. Well, I'm telling you now, come down. That's it.